Um, I'm Danielle Kirchmar. I'm the curator here at the RSM Gallery at the Bentley Library. And we're so pleased to have you all here to hear about the work tonight and to have uh, to showcase Ariel Basson Freiberg's work. Um, Ariel received her um, BA. I'm going to just tell you a little bit about Ariel, and then she's going to tell you about the you know the research and the process behind this beautiful work that I've like been fortunate enough to spend you know, the past week um, with as we've been installing and finding just the right way to try and tell this tell you know this the visual story within the gallery here. Um, Ariel uh, has her, her BA in studio art from Smith College and an MFA from um, Boston University. She's shown throughout um, throughout New England and New York and has um, been doing business, visiting artist lectures uh, across New England, actually even down the street at Gun Academy, which is her nice, and as uh, currently teaching and running the post -back program at, at Brandeis. And has had her work most uh, recently this summer at the Brookline Community Art Center, where is that correct? <laughs> where, where I was able to um, to see it. And we both also are fortunate enough to be um, Somerville artists. Art, Art Ariel received uh, Somerville Community Arts grants, I think, last year and a few years actually in Summit. So um, I we're just so pleased to have this work here. I and mean, there's so many. Um, you know, Ariel is shown at Abigail Ogilvy, so many amazing galleries in Boston, so we're really um, grateful to have her showing here at the RSM Gallery and talking about this, you know, this new work. So, um, let's give a hand for Ariel. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, everyone, for being here this afternoon, um, this evening. Um, thank you, Bentley University, um, Bentley Library, for hosting the space and bringing art, um, you know, onto campus. Um, I feel like that's like the the heart of, you know, part of why we're making art is to you know get it into communities where there's going to be conversation. Um, so a little bit about this project, so from silk to cement. Um, so the project started where I was trying to sort of uncover um, the background of my family. So my family um, on my mom's side is from Baghdad and they left in the 1950s um, due to persecution, religious and political persecution. And through, this, uh, through an airlift um, that was coordinated between the uh, Iraqi government and Israeli government. Um, over, I don't know, over 100,000 Jews were basically airlifted in succession um, in the 1950s. Um, and my grandfather had this amazing fabric shop in the heart of um, the Baghdadi um, uh, market. And in, in this market, you know, you could see, you know, basically everything is in this market. Um, and his fabric shop was even known to get the, the sheikh from Saudi Arabia coming through um, to buy fabrics for all of his wives. Um, and then also um, one of my living relatives who remembers that time pretty clearly. Um, she's in her early 90s. Uh, uh, my, uh, I consider her an aunt, even though she's I guess technically like a distant cousin or something, but um, her name is Doris. She lives in Montreal and she remembers going into his fabric shop, having coffee and tea, gossiping, people watching. Um, so some of the drawings and prints are inspired from conversations that I've had with her um, or translated with my mom. Um, since she, her primary language she held on to is um, the uh, Jewish Baghdadi um, Arabic, so uh, which my mom professed that she only knows a hundred words, even though it's her mother tongue. Um, <laughs> so, um, so kind of tying into um, the why it's been harder for me to access this. I grew up in Texas, in Houston, Texas. So mall country, you know, um, Longhorns, totally far away from uh, the Middle East. Um, and in order for my mom and family to assimilate, they kind of let go of that side of their, um, their identity. So it wasn't really spoken at home. And when I would go visit my grandparents in, in Israel, um, 
I didn't know that they were speaking more than one language at the same time. So it was, you know, I had to kind of slowly uncover that, wait a second, there's actually a whole other language happening at the same time. So, um, so in that process, the sort of unveiling um, of I, I, identity, um, that's where I found myself exploring the silk um, to cement. So my grandfather had this fabric shop, and then I was sort of thinking about emotionally, um, you know, how he transitioned as a refugee with his family um, in Israel and established um, a construction business. It took about seven years. Um, they were in a refugee camp for two years and then eventually um, were able, they um, lived in a kibbutz for a year and then eventually were able to um, move into, you know, more substantial dwellings. And I, you know, part of, you know, what became really important for my grandfather was to create safe and sound housing for both his family, but also the um, uh, Iraqi community. So the Iraqi community that ended up in, um, in Israel, they mostly were in Ramat Gan. And so he built a bunch of um, apartment buildings and um, and business and uh, buildings for businesses. So he really kind of repositioned um, his community through cement. And I was thinking about, you know, how, you know, what it would mean to go from, you know, almost as an artist, right? To go from working with like silks and fine materials and, you know, the luxuriousness of being in a shop and spreading out the fabric and um, to having to, you know, work with like rebar and cement and foam and all these other kinds of you know, harsh materials in the hot sun. Like, you know, he always wore a suit with a tie and suspenders, um, you know, uh, I mean, until his dying day. He was always, you know, impeccably dressed. So it's kind of interesting that kind of also, again, that kind of contrast um, of identities. Um, so that's part of where the cement paintings um, arose. And you'll notice that there's also photo transfer prints um, embedded into, um, the cement painting. So this was initially a public art project that was outdoors um, for several months um, this summer and fall. Um, and Danielle, you know, um, graciously invited me to reinstall it in the interior space. So um, what else can I mention? Um, there's one um, photo transfer document that I think is kind of important to highlight. Um, so this uh, document features uh, my grandfather with a little advertisement for, um, it's written in Hebrew in the middle there, it says apartments, um, for uh, advertising his business. And then on the right is the declaration from the Iraqi monarch, monarch that um, states um, that all the um, assets and possessions of Jews that left Iraq after 1948 um, would become nationalized in possession of the government. Um, and then they reissued this law in 1968. And then last year they made it that if there was any, um, anyone had any kind of connection to anyone who was, um, uh, you know, culturally or business wise um, connected to Israel, the, um, the, uh, 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 the repercussions um, is uh, hanging or imprisonment for life. So, um, whereas before, like prior to that, um, I knew people that were going back and forth, um, you know, between London and Baghdad, um, but now um, that we're Jewish, and now it's really, it's really super complicated. Um, and also, people don't want to, you know, um, uh, set up a situation where they put somebody else in trouble. So, um, so that document was kind of a, a like a, the fusion of these two different elements. And I was thinking about how how sometimes government policy can also, um, you know, dictate even um, our like life work in a way, um, and maybe shift us and, and force us to adapt in ways that you know we wouldn't imagine. Um, and then to the right, there's uh, an emulet, a cameo, um, that's uh, created from many different like uh, elements, um, including a wolf's tooth, which is a common one. Um, uh, and then below that, there's an image um, that features my Aunt Carmela and then her friend, and they were at the beach, it was based off of a photograph. And then the photo transfer is of an uh, Iraqi dinar that has Saddam Hussein on it. Um, so I was thinking about how um, 
uh, you, how like my grandmother I know was super upset when um, Saddam Hussein became in power of the Ba'ath Party. Um, so they were very, you know, it was very, they were very upset, but they also, you know, didn't really speak about it. It was something where maybe one or two words would be mentioned, but they were pretty close-lipped about, um, uh, about their feelings around the subject. So I don't want to talk too much, but if anyone has any questions, yeah, oh yes, please. I'm just also curious, it makes me curious about uh, the history of Jews in Iraq, or not even before Iraq became a country, right? Because you think of Babylon and Samaria, and um, of course those, I guess, interactions were documented in religious texts, right? Yes, yeah, so uh, Nebuchadnezzar in like 536 BC, um, basically brought a whole group of Jews as slaves to um, that region, um, to Babylon, and um, and then a certain point, he, they he sort of released them. He said, "You know what? You guys can go." He had them digging a canal between the Tigris and. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the other river, but be Euphrates. Euphrates, yes, yeah, okay, Euphrates, yes, okay, okay, glad people know. Okay, so basically they were sitting, you know, they were there digging away um, as slaves, and then eventually they uh, became, you know, accepted into the community, um, and then following, um, you know, that time period, then there was the Ottoman Empire that was ruling that region. Um, Jews were somewhat protected, but they weren't considered equal um, during that time period. But then once it was World War I, we would sort of move more into the present um, uh, and uh, influence from the British. Um, uh, things became, you know, in some ways better for the Jews, but then also dramatically worse because of the rise of Nazism and anti Semitism. So um, that, I guess, is kind of like a brief, <laughs> like a brief summary. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. This is. Uh Compared to the um, installation outside, the idea of uh, basing on in fabric is really so great. It's really um, Thank you. surprising and um, it was great to see. Um, did you work a lot on these between um, the installation outside? Did you um, paint more? Um, um, I didn't. I didn't. So it just uh, looks very different. Yeah, I think it's just the outdoor experience versus the indoor experience. Yeah. So because I think the there's lighting. there's lighting and there's it's sort of a more intimate environment. Okay. Um, so I think like some some aspects come out more in, uh -huh. in that. Um, I guess the only thing, yeah, the only thing that is like shifted is um, the fabric, and um, there's some more wedges <laughs> <laughs> floating around. Were the works on paper part of the outdoor? Uh, no, it was just the just the cement painting. Oh, great! But that, that adds an element, of, a near element that's really strong, especially the one you introduced. Yeah. Thanks. Can you speak a little bit about your approach to the process of these? And because and, I'm seeing, you know, with the cement and, and obviously like the trowel marks and all of that. And, you know, I know you as a, you know, more fine art painter. So <laughs> speak a little bit about that exploration and process um, and, you know, how it might change how you think about painting going forward. Yeah, so yeah, um, the, so the process of cement painting. So I started making the cement, cement paintings um, in 2015 um, uh, on like hardy board, which is like cement board. Um, I made a, f I just made a few tests. I had kind of, that was around the time that I made this piece. Um, and I started thinking really specifically about this transformation that my grandfather went through with the medium mediums of like silk to cement. Um, and so I thought, oh, well, maybe I need to actually work with cement in order to kind of tap into that, that I needed to evolve my medium. But it was slow going, because I'm, I'm like a really traditional oil painter. <laughs> so, you know, so it was, it was kind of like I did this stuff, and I was like, I don't know if I'm ready to show it or do anything else with it. And so it's kind of sat around, and I revisited it again during a residency at Mass MoCA um, and got some support from that. And then, um, and then I received a, um, a grant to be able to do this work. So um, the grant made a big difference for me to be able to do this project. But one thing that I figured out when 
in those initial cement paintings was to, I wanted the cement to feel painterly. Because normally you think about cement, it's so rigid and stiff and it doesn't really, yeah, it, it doesn't have like the transformative quality that, um, that oil paint can have. Um, and then I used glitter um, and acrylic paint um, in order to you know, change the color and stuff throughout, throughout it. Um, and then building the imagery, you know, part of it was um, from research that I've done, um, you know, visiting like other museums, um, uh, uh, reading different scholars' work on, on the subject, um, and then talking with my family. So I have um, a group of uh, one side of my family, my um, um, grandmother's brother's side of the family. Um, they stayed in Iraq until the 1970s, and then they were smuggled by the Kurds through Iran. Um, so, which was a really kind of death-defying um, situation. Um, and they ended up in Germany for several years, and eventually in London, and you know, and now they're yeah, now they're in uh, in Canada. Um, so I talked to them also to you know here more specifically because they, they stayed a tight community um, and they, you know, as much as they, they're like huge advocates for Israel, but they just don't, they just didn't, um, you know, they didn't feel the need to shroud their identity as much as like my mom's side of the family um, because they just stuck together as, as a group. Um, and they kept their language. Um, so, and like Doris, you know, she's like, oh, I'm not gonna speak in, in English because, uh, you know, why should I assimilate? Like, they're, they're very, you know, they kind of take on this almost radical stance, even though they've been like, I don't know, she's been in Canada for over 20 years or something. So, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so then with the, the cement, I wear gloves and then I just like work the cement with my hands. So in a way it's kind of like childish because you're like building up the material. Um, and then I find, you know, ways to like, um, yeah, bring more of like the drawing into it. And yeah, and then the trowels, I, so my grandfather in, the, in their home um, in Israel that he built with his partner. Um, the print that's next to the kids hanging um, is based off of a photograph of him with his partner. Um, the print's called Breaking Ground. So uh, they, they built like a split house. So half the house was his partner's and the other half was um, for his family. And in the ceiling in the living room, they made these, um, he took like the plaster and then some kind of device to create almost these, this like cave-like effect with recessed lighting. So he would do all this kind of crazy stuff with like plaster and cement. And so he was, you know, he was definitely creative and thinking outside the box because I'd never seen that in any anyone's like private house before. Um, and maybe it was also like the, you know, I don't know, 70s trend to do, I don't know, texture was a big thing in the well, 70s. I think when you say somebody <laughs> went into construction, I mean, and he was, you said it was like a seven year process. I mean, you know, we think of that, you, you, can, you can work for someone who's in construction and actually do the construction, or you can be a person that is, has a construction company where the tie is sued all the time. It sounds like for that seven year period, he probably was like, rolling up his sleeves and you know working your way up. I can't imagine any other way for you to get into the construction business without doing construction. Oh yeah, he business. definitely he so definitely that, did. He definitely you, um, yeah. permission to kind of mess with your own experiment in your own house once you learn how to do things. And I think it must be must have been pretty interesting when you start working with this and the, the problem part going, I wonder if I bring that, that you know like that's yeah. a real connection when you're using the same process as someone, you know, in your family that probably was having to learn it from scratch as well. You know, you can probably stretch a canvas, you know? Yeah. It's such an interesting, you guys followed the, uh, a path of kind of material path um, that was, you know, like not, I mean, you chose to do it, but it was uh, not as easy or as you weren't as comfortable. I was wondering how you, you know, when you're very established painting a certain way, what, how you give yourself artistically permission to do, or if it's this radically different. If you guys haven't seen her other work, I think that you learn as much by looking at what she was doing before this group of work as you will by looking at this because it's really, you know, you really decided to speak in a language that was appropriate to this research and very mm -hmm. different from, you know, what we all uh, have, you know, done a, a lot of great bodies of work that were very, you know, polished but different from this. 
Yeah. And really expressive. And it, this is like such a different um, exploration. It's really, you know, it's surprising to see this big of a change in your work. I, I want to yeah. just as a character yeah. also say, I went to the studio visit and we sort of were discussing, you know, in the studio, at, you know, how will this, how will the work be in, in the gallery? And Ariel had a bunch of the drawings and I was like, oh, you know, she's like, well, I have these drawings. I'm like, oh, that would be great. We'll have the drawings on the wall. And she also had some of the, like, these food paintings that she's been working on. Where <laughs> 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 and we set them all her and to leave. So I was like, but I want them all. <laughs> they're, so, they're so stunning and they're so, and that's also related to the cultural history, but I also knew that, like, I, you know, I wanted to make sure we had the ability to see the work in the space, but it was hard not to, like, be like, please bring them all. <laughs> Oh, well, thanks, Danielle and James. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Did you? Oh, I just want to, I don't want to. Yeah. Oh, no. Go ahead. Well, and, one thing one I see is uh, documentation, mm -hmm. right? Like with the, the documents, and then it looks like there's a wallet over there. You have a letter. I was wondering if that, that's something that was, you know, you were conscious of or you wanted to include documentation. Yes, so you know, a big part of you know trying to sort of un, I guess to unearth um, unearth the family history and identity uh, was through you know cultural doc, uh, documentation, and I felt like the only way to access that was to have either the illusion of that or the some, somewhat literalness of it through so through the transfer prints, um, and then you know I think about the cement paintings as like the gap. The sort of gap between you know having a physical thing that you can refer to um, and the imagination. So, because I think that's a huge part of you know as you know being an artist is is finding you know it's that gap that fissure and that's a huge part of why I became became an artist. Um, so, like speaking of the wallet, so. Um, uh, the wallet was actually based off of um, after my grandfather passed away. Um, we were, you know, going through some of the belongings, and then I found his, you know, wallet and some other, you know, mundane objects. And I opened it, and then there was this photograph of me, 16-year-old in some, you know, like um, uh, Nutcracker production. And <laughs> and I just rem I was just like, my mom must have sent it to him. And I remember like that moment, I remember being on the couch with him and he would, he pulled out stuff out of his wallet. That was kind of like something that he did. Cause he, all the things that were important to me were in his wallet. And I remember being like younger that he had, you know, when he had sent that, uh, when we were sitting together and we were looking at, looking at the stuff in his wallet and he pulled out that photograph. I was so embarrassed, but we were laughing and he was clearly like proud of me but then at the same time I was realizing that I was orientalizing myself in that moment because through European ballet um, and you know normally he would have not approved of seeing his grandchild dressed like a harem girl like that would be <laughs> totally taboo right like that is like I mean you know the like yeah the the cult the culture Iraqi culture is like modesty is still very you know still very pronounced and um, but that also says something about my grandfather, how he was able to adapt to the times. And because I was coming from the, from the US, like, I think there was more acceptance um, there. So I felt like that was part of, that sort of also that realization after he had passed away about what, you know, how, how are we, we were relating to each other, how we were connecting, and then also even like cultural disconnects that were arising. Um, and, you know, we were also both, you know, he was speaking in broken English, I'm speaking in broken Hebrew, and we're like trying to like make sense of, you know, things in, and part of that would be through um, sometimes, you know, obviously through gesture and like um, brief conversation, but also through objects. So there was this kind of trans translation of love through object too. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I wanted to just say that I, I love seeing the work outdoors because I got to see it in the fall when there were so many colors that work so well. But I love seeing it here, again, in a way clustered where they feel like fragments part of a whole. And I love the way your story also and our memories work in similar kind of fragmented recall and the transfer and the your ability to draw, um, it's just really, um, really wonderful to see 
all these parts, so complicated, but really come together and, and not, you know, it's like I keep discovering things in the room and, and I just think it's a really generous um, invite, so. Thank you, Tori. To Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I missed the beginning of the talk, but I was like, couldn't escape the, maybe some tombstone? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. The idea of some of these, and especially a broken tombstone, which is many times associated with Jewish cemeteries being basically sometimes, you know, like vandalated, you know, the, van, you know, the, the vandalism, the, uh, but also like this, this kind of tombstone, say, that is sort of like showing a broken, a bro like a broken history. It's, it's mm -hmm. not a full, you know, like the nice. Uh, all of them uh, is so, so, so there's something about the broken life that it was cut in, in someone, not in, not on, you know, unnaturally. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I guess that's how I embodied it as, you know, the um, grandchild of the ref refugees. Like, I think that's the memories were broken for me and they were broken for them. And, you know, thinking specifically about broken, so like the broken teapot, like one memory that my grandmother brought up a lot was how when, um, when they were like leaving and they were being inspected before they got on the, the airplane flight, um, they had some boxes of tea and they're, they're obsessed with tea. I mean, they're high tea, four o'clock with biscuits, like, every day for you know their entire existence basically um, and they took the boxes of tea and they maybe thought that there was something hidden inside and they just threw it on the ground so they weren't even able to bring like tea leaves with them um, and so that broken that brokenness um, yeah it definitely you know on my grandmother's side it really it broke her family completely because they were they were really wealthy established people and then suddenly they were like you know, extracted from their homeland for a thousand years plus and, you know, put in an environment where they, you know, barely, they didn't really have, you know, running water and <laughs> basic necessities. And um, yeah, it was really, it was very hard for her parents, like died not too so long after that. And then also her brother, Aaron. So um, Doris, her, um, her husband, um, so right before they left in the 70s, um, uh, his best friend was hung in the middle of um, uh, one of the squares in Baghdad. And when he saw his friend hanging in the, in, you know, in the middle of the square, he, the next day he had a heart attack. And so then, and he had um, four daughters and then his wife, Doris. And so they were just, it was, yeah, it was, there was a lot of trauma. <laughs> so I, you know, but you know, it's sort of, you know, it's interesting because like as an artist, you're, you know, how do you contend with trauma and how do you um, contend with aestheticizing, right? In, in some way, because, um, because there needs to be a way to like access it and, and for it to give back to like the viewer in some way. So that's, yeah, the tombstone aspect is definitely, I don't know if I was intentionally thinking of it initially, but it came out really obvious right away, especially like this one and then some of the other ones. So, yeah. yeah. So, do you have a question? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you were thinking about this cement board so um, excluding like the sceneries, I noticed that there was a lot of playing with overlays and just like a diff different textures. Um, is there like a specific sort of texture that you saw growing up that inspired these textures or was this just like your own personal style and what you like aesthetically speaking? Yeah, I guess, you know, I, I think it, again, this is part of like embodying it, um, the, the sort of experience of my identity and family, um, because we were so multi-layered, like that there was multiple languages being spoken. Um, there was always, you know, subtext happening at the same time. Um, my grandparents, you know, every, you know, 
every wall um, was covered with a piece of art of some kind. Like they just like packed it in. They were more is more, um, you know. So I think that was like part of it. And I think also then, you know, I would go and be in my grandparents' house for a month, and then I would be extracted, and then be back in Houston, Texas, with the malls and like long car rides and everything. So it was all like all those layers and then also being yeah being in in texas and being misidentified all the time um and then yeah and then also um yeah and then trying to kind of like you know fit in <laughs> uh in in yeah in you know good old houston yeah yeah <laughs> so i was thinking about the difference that you pointed out between your aunt doris and your uh, grandparents family um, in terms of like assimilation and what they kept and what they didn't and I I, I don't know if every, other people would know that but Israel um, from the founding and into the 70s when we came was very much about assimilation yeah. and the the idea was that it was it's a um, like this melting pot, like you're not, not even melting pot, you're supposed to uh, throw away your di diaspora identity and assume the Israeli identity. And so yeah. I feel like that's, that's uh, definitely part of it, and definitely that wouldn't have been as strong in um, Canada. And I feel like when we came here, I, uh, you know, I, for myself, I became more interested in my Russian background because it was no longer like this uncool thing that I was trying to <laughs> leave behind. Yeah, I, and I, I think yeah, it's definitely. not so much now. I mean, it yeah, definitely it's definitely changed, mm -hmm. but in this kind of like very much of belief in um, Zionism as the you know ideology of like everyone becoming. Something yeah, else. everyone becoming this like new identity collectively coming from all different places yeah. in the world. And um, yeah, I mean, that's also one thing that, you know, I was thinking about when I started this project was thinking about the diversity of Jewish identity, um, which, you know, in the US, usually there's like a monolithic identity. And part of that is seen through entertainment and so forth. Um, but um, but yeah, there is yeah, definitely, you know, my mom's side of the family, for sure. It, you know, everything they wanted to do was become Israeli. That was so important to them. So, um, but then, but then at the same time, um, there was, you know, they held on to the food was really important. And then I think, and then there was some artistic practices that were kept up. Yeah. Uh, was there um, like a, I don't know what you call it, like a Creole language that Jewish people spoke in Iraq, like kind of a mix of Arabic? Yes, so um, yeah, my family speaks a dialect that's Judea Arabic. Um, it's a combination of Arabic and Aramaic. Um, it's definitely, you know, there's definitely some words that are clearly like Arabic, but most of it is this totally specific language. Um, and I have a friend who's Kurdish, and I'm, you know, mentioned a bunch of phrases to him. who's like, I have no, you know, Kurdish from Northern Iraq. He had zero idea what I was saying, like zero. <laughs> I was like, OK. Uh, you know, um, and actually, this summer, I signed up online for a virtual uh, class to learn a little bit of my, like, Baghdadi Arabic. Um, and yeah, it was, it was interesting, but it definitely very hard. <laughs> um, but you know, speaking of that, so um, some of the imagery um, has a photo transfer of a letter that's a mixture of Hebrew and Baghdadi Arabic. Um, and then on, in the um, display case, um, there's a photograph, photo transfer of um, my aunt as a baby um, sitting on a little toilet called a koto, which was like a, apparently like a common Iraqi, you know, child's potty. Um, and in the back of the photograph, my grandfather wrote in classical Arabic a letter to his brother. Um, 
And it was basically, his brother was in Israel, it was 1948, and he, um, uh, his brother Joseph, Joseph said, hey, you just had a baby. He called him up and said, send me a photo, I want to see you, this, you know, this is your first child. And so my grandfather, you know, got the little, like, the, got the photograph printed, and it's so funny because it's, you know, I mean, how people who have kids, like, how many photos you have of, of them on the potty? Like, it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of a thing. Or maybe, like, your parents have photos of you or something, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so when he sent it, um, the government, the um, Iraqi government intercepted um, it and decided that my grandfather was a spy. So then they imprisoned him for it. Um, and yeah, he was kept in jail for a while until they were able to bribe and negotiate um, for his release. Um, but that was, that was a really um, marked moment and that was part of the reason why um, my family decided to leave when they did. Um, they also, my uncle was only seven days old when they left. So um, it was really, yeah, it was kind of, it was definitely intense. My grandmother never like fully recovered from it. Whereas like, I feel like, um, you know, I think because she was just extracted from her community um, in such a severe way. Um, my grandfather was more adaptable um, in a sense, but so, yeah. But thank you all so much. Yes, this is you. great. Thank you so much.